Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the previous episode we extended the functionality of content tools so that it can now create environment cube maps from equirectangular images. These environment maps can be used as a global light source for the objects in the scene. This is known as image-based lighting or IBL which we'll be working on in this and the next few episodes of the series. Since the light is coming from all directions, we have to treat each point of the environment map as a light source and accumulate the contribution of each point for each pixel that's rendered. Obviously, this involves a lot of lighting calculations and therefore impractical for real-time rendering. However, we can pre-calculate a large part of the computations and put them in lookup textures and use those while doing image-based lighting. This is the process of pre-filtering environment maps, which needs to be done for diffuse and specular parts separately. In this episode, we'll look at pre-filtering for the diffuse part. Let's have a look at how we compute direct lighting for a single light source. We have seen that it's the sum of a diffuse part and a specular part. The diffuse part scatters the light in all directions, and therefore it depends only on light direction. The specular part reflects light in a mirrored direction and scatters the light depending on the surface roughness. Consequentially, it depends both on light direction and view direction. In this episode, we are going to only consider the contribution of the diffuse part. We'll do the specular part in the next episode. We have already implemented direct lighting and since we are familiar with the code, I think it's okay to get a bit more mathematical about it. So, looking at the diffuse part of the rendering equation, we know that diffuse irradiance is the product of the diffuse BRDF and the incident light. The light intensity is adjusted for the angle of incident. So, less light is reflected at grazing angles, where theta is almost zero or almost pi. More light is reflected when the light direction is perpendicular to the surface. Using the Lambert diffuse BRDF, we can write the diffuse irradiance as a simple equation. This is a reasonable model for single light sources that are far away or for lights that have zero area, such as point lights and spotlights. Now consider light coming from the environment of an object. Suppose we'd like to calculate lighting at a point on a polygon with normal n. This would mean that we treat each point in the environment as a light source. Only points on this side of the polygon would contribute to the lighting. Mathematically, we can write this as an integral. Don't worry if you're not familiar with integrals and how they are calculated. We don't have to solve an integral at this time, and you can view them as a sum of whatever it's in here for each tiny element given by this part. I do recommend learning about integrals as they are essential in any advanced technical field, including computer science. Nevertheless, we'll see how we can work with this in a minute. There are three ways we can try and compute the diffuse lighting in this case. Brute force sum, discrete sum, and by random sampling. We are going to implement all three, so we can see the pros and cons of each method. The brute force method just samples all pixels that are visible on the hemisphere and calculates the integral by adding them all up. This is of course the most computationally expensive method that involves hundreds of thousands of samples per normal direction. This is okay since pre-filtering is done offline during content preparation, so it doesn't need to be blazingly fast. However, for large environment textures, it can take longer or even become undoable on lower-end GPUs. Well, I forgot to also mention that we are going to do pre-filtering using compute shaders, since it would take forever to do on a CPU. Using this method, the resulting diffuse texture looks like this. Instead of sampling all pixels on the hemisphere, we could sample on regular intervals, skipping the pixels in between. This works okay for environments where there are no small lights which we could miss, but can lead to noisy results for high-frequency light environments. Of course we could make the intervals smaller, but this results in larger number of samples and can still have considerable aliasing. 
The third method is by randomly sampling each pixel on the hemisphere. As we'll see later in this video, using uniform random values is still not a great way of doing it, since it will result in non-uniform sampling of the hemisphere. Using important sampling, we can map the uniform random values in such a way that the hemisphere is more likely to be sampled where it has a larger contribution. This method still has the drawback of being noisy for images with tiny light sources, but it's somewhat better than discrete sampling, especially when we increase the sample count. Now let's look at each method in more detail. Brute force method is the simplest one. This function is called for each of the directions that we want to pre-calculate. So for each direction normal, we sample literally every pixel of the environment cube map that's in front of it and add all of them together. However, we must be aware that sampling the cube map this way results in non-uniform distribution of samples as you can see here. The pixels near the corners of the cube have a higher density when projected onto a sphere than the pixels near the center of each face. Therefore, we should weight the pixels by a factor that's called the differential solid angle as calculated here. The derivation of this factor can be found on this website, which you can find a link to in the video description. However, it was Matt Petinio who pointed out the issue when I was asking about my result looking incorrect. Note that the cosine weight is also added here. Instead of counting the number of samples, we add all weight values and divide by the sum in order to average the final value. The getSampleDirectionCubeMap converts the pixel position that we want to sample to a direction vector that can be used for sampling the cube map. This follows the cube map face ordering of Direct3D as we see here. Also note that although this method gives the best results, in case of large textures the value of sample count could become relatively large compared to the weight value that we are adding. This could result in precision issues and a higher numerical error. In Primal Editor we are using a maximum size of 256 for pre-filtered cube maps, so this shouldn't become a problem. As I mentioned earlier, we sample an entire hemisphere of the source cube map for each pixel of the pre-filtered cube map. Each pixel here represents a direction in world space and our compute shader here is run for each one of them. This is also true for discrete and random sampling methods. Let's look at discrete sampling method next. Here we have to convert the diffuse lighting integral to a discrete sum. We can use a Riemann sum to do this. A Riemann sum is a method for approximating the total area under a curve or the integral of a function on a given interval. It involves dividing the interval into smaller subintervals, calculating the area of rectangles that approximate the curve on each subinterval, and then summing these areas. We can see this process in action here on Wikipedia. Each bar or rectangle here represents a sample. Note that increasing the number of samples improves the accuracy of the calculated area. We can use this method to convert our integral to a discrete sum. In order to do so, we need to understand what d omega is. Considering that we are integrating the surface of a sphere, d omega is a small surface element on the sphere. Using polar coordinates again, we can see that the area of this surface element can be expressed in terms of theta and phi, where theta is the vertical angle going from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, and phi is the horizontal angle going all the way around. So phi is between 0 and 2 pi. Note that the width of d omega approaches 0 at the poles of the sphere. Therefore, we need to scale it by sine of theta. Expressing d omega in terms of theta and pi, we can write the integral with respect to polar angles. Note that the inner integral is over theta, and because we are only sampling one hemisphere, it goes from 0 to pi over 2. Now we can use the Riemann sum to approximate this integral. For phi, b minus a equals 2 pi minus 0, and the number of samples in the direction of phi is n1. Similarly, b minus a for theta equals pi over 2 minus 0, and n2 is the number of samples in direction of theta. 
Of course, we can choose N1 and N2 freely. The product of these two numbers is the total sample count. Also note that we express the light direction in terms of phi and theta as well. We see that these terms cancel out and we end up with this sum. Converting this to code is now rather easy. It's a double for loop where we define a step size and increase phi and theta from zero to their maximum value. In order to sample from the cube map, we first convert from polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates. We transform the resulting vector to the frame of our normal vector. This basically rotates us towards the enclosing hemisphere. This direction vector is used to sample from the cube map, after which it's multiplied by sine and cosine of theta, which is literally this expression here. At the end, we have to multiply the result by pi and divide by the total number of samples. Again, this corresponds to this part of the sum. As we can see, the result isn't really great, even for relatively high number of samples. However, doing it this way helped us to better understand the relation between mathematics and the code. We can use this knowledge to improve the quality of the pre-filtered image. Let's look at the actual distribution of samples using the discrete method. I made this little WPF application for visualizing different sampling patterns, which you can also download if you are a Patreon or Coffee supporter. Looking at this pattern, it's easy to see how this would cause the aliasing problem in the image. Also note that sample density is much higher around the pole of the hemisphere. It's particularly bad at the pole itself, where the same pixel is sampled multiple times. We could consider using random numbers to sample the hemisphere with about the same number of samples. We can use Hammersley sequence to generate a uniformly distributed sequence of numbers in the range between 0 and 1. Please watch this video where the maths behind this is explained very clearly. Calling this function returns two numbers, which we can scale to the intervals used for phi and theta. This is how we get the random points on the surface of the hemisphere. The rest of calculations is exactly the same as for discrete sampling. Looking at the sampling pattern for uniform random sampling, we see that although the pattern is much less regular, it is not uniform. Again, the sample density is higher at the pole. We are also taking a lot of samples at grazing angles, where we know that they are not going to contribute much to the total lighting. For this reason, we still have to weight the sampled value by cosine of theta and scale it by sine of theta, as we see here. Now, what if we would distribute our random numbers in such a way that it would result in a more uniform sampling pattern, and preferably at places where they have the most importance? Let's say we would sample phi uniformly as we did before, so it's the same as here. However, we use this expression for theta instead. Plotting this function, we can see that it's still between 0 and pi over 2, which is the range that we want for theta. But now most of random values are mapped to this region. The shader code is very similar to uniform random sampling, except now we can use the square root of the random value for sine of theta. We can calculate cosine of theta using these identities. Sine and cosine of phi are calculated as before. Looking at the sampling pattern, we see that it's perfectly uniform for phi, and for theta, it takes fewer samples at grazing angles, which is what we wanted. And because of this distribution, we no longer have to weight the samples with the sine and cosine of theta. The resulting image still has some noise, but it looks better than the discrete method using the same sample count. This method is known as important sampling, which offers a way for deriving the relation between uniform random values and the sampling parameters as we see here. Today I just wanted to introduce the concept of important sampling so that we can get a feeling of what it actually does. In the next episode I'll discuss the mathematics of important sampling and how it's used to determine the sampling parameters. If you can't wait till the next episode, I would recommend watching this excellent video about important sampling for graphics programming. In the next video, we are going to look at adding support for cube maps that are pre-filtered. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.